The last year has been a momentous one for all inhabitants of Scotland. So far, so good. Including the rare and endangered animals that call this place home. So ginger, 100% belongs in this country. At Edinburgh Zoo, go! And Highland Wildlife Park. <laughs> Dedicated staff have been at the forefront of conservation for over a century. No matter how big the job, the first of many. Or small the species. There's a special place in your heart for the small things. So you drop the tank, you mess it up, game over. We'll meet the 260 strong team working to preserve over 3,000 unique animals. I like Kato more than I like most people. I'm obviously especially in love with Sale. A job in which no two days are the same. You're wondering what I'm doing, aren't you? Oh, he's right behind you again. <laughs> Every moment is cherished. Getting the chance to work with these guys is incredible. Dream job. <laughs> They're super cute, so it's all worth it, really. Welcome inside the zoo. Carry on, Zuki Pink. Wildlife conservation is at the heart of the work being carried out at Highland Wildlife Park, and currently one of its biggest projects is to save Scotland's wildcats. A dedicated team are working on a breed and release programme, which hopes to see wildcats in Scotland thrive once more in their natural habitat. This is offshore to the public. This is the really quiet, remote part of the, the wildlife park. What we're building here, the breeding enclosure, so this is where the cats will come over the next couple of months and we'll pair them up for breeding. A massive £5.4 million of funding and support has been secured from both national and international partners. The new breeding centre is a top priority. There are four double enclosures under construction, which will become home to 16 breeding cats, some of whose offspring may be released into the Scottish Islands. Phase one of the project is taking shape. Hey Steve, how's hey, things? Oh, the frame's going for the doors, all right. Oh, nice, ah, good. It's all of our own guys that are doing it, which is fantastic. I mean, as you can see, they're doing a fantastic job. It's very much a team effort. All right, we're all learning as we're going, but we're getting it done. All right. Uncharted territory for a lot of us, I think, in this. Uh, a decision. Yeah. Um, when it comes to latching these gates here, we've got two options. First is to put a wooden block there that yep. by it and has a hole drilled in it. Yep. I certainly won't lie and say that I had a hammer in my hand for uh, for nine months or anything like that, but I designed the facility, um, looked at all the different options, where we could put it in the park, the type of enclosures that we would build. So it's it's been incredibly exciting, really. It's, a, it's um, you know, a huge uh, praise to the, the construction team that we have in the park to bring this to life. This was started in the, the structure is early October. So I mean, for all of this to go up in the space of three, four months is, in, is incredible. We'll just block this up completely with timber or something or mesh. The op option two is a loop of high tensile fencing wire. You could you drill a hole drill through a hole that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. We're only offering two things to decide from, you see. <laughs> yeah. You give them more options, options, it gets more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> the enclosures have been designed to minimise human contact and provide the breeding cats with a safe and secure home, which retains elements of how they would live in the wild. They're, they've got a good amount of height so we can make co complex areas for the cats so the cats can be physically and mentally stimulated. The size of these enclosures and the amount of natural vegetation in these enclosures, the cats will hopefully revert back to their sort of natural activity patterns, they'll grow a, a probably an increasing dislike for humans, which is what we want. When we come up here to feed them or to change water, they'll go and hide, so we'll never see them. There's a lot riding on the success of this scheme. We're just doing everything we can to give wildcat survival the best chance. Hopefully it'll be a, a very nice highland home for the cats. Fifteen miles southeast of Highland Wildlife Park, among Edinburgh Zoo's diverse bird collection, lives Philip, the famously feisty guinea fowl, 
his mate and their two daughters. One of whom, who was yet to be named, was found this morning with a broken leg. Anne is now at the veterinary hospital. If the guinea fowl's femur or thigh bone is irreparable, Adam will have no choice but to euthanise her. An x-ray shows that the leg is smashed into multiple pieces. There's always that decision about what the prognosis is when we first assess a new case and how bad things look. Those initial x-rays really give us that information. It's quite a, a nasty fracture, so the bone is actually broken into to three separate sections with some nasty longitudinal fractures in there rather than just transverse across the bone. Um, and so there's always that debate of do we want to put the animal through quite a major surgery? Um, but I think on balance this is a, a young bird, it was only, only hatched last year, um, and so we wanted to give her the best possible chance. With the guinea fowl sedated, Adam, aided by vet Steph and veterinary nurse Hannah, begins what is an invasive and delicate surgery. So I've just opened up over the fracture site so that the bone is broken into three pretty big pieces um, and I've run a pin all the way down through those pieces and we're just going to check the location of that. Another x-ray is essential now. OK, great. If we... Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. We're just going to take a quick, a quick x-ray in the theatre. I've still got some more pinning to do, but I just want to check the location of that that first pin before we go further. It's um yeah, it's not a very nice looking fracture, so I just want to make sure if this has got a good prognosis to keep going, because otherwise there's no point putting the bird through it. Bird bones are incredibly mineral rich, which poses very particular problems. They're more inclined to just shatter into lots of pieces. Um, and they also, with, with particularly fractures at the femur, it's one of the few places in the bird which is surrounded by lots of muscles. So as soon as the bone breaks, all the muscles pull it in and the bone just gets concertinaed up into, into pieces. But Steph can see from the x-ray that the first pin Adam's put in is exactly where it needs to be. Perfect. Yeah, is there, there is, here. Yeah, there isn't a fracture beyond that, is there? That is okay. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Yeah. All good. And, good. Uh, it's all right. Yeah, good. Perfect, Adam. Well done. <laughs> well, that's step one. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we'll get too, too happy yet. <laughs> so we, we've got, yeah, we've got a pin position down the middle of all of the fragments now, so they're all in a row and lined up. I need to put some pins in the outside now. Um, ideally, getting them into the areas of bone which are strong and not, not involved in the fracture to give some pin support on the outside to stop everything twisting around the pin, which is down the middle. Um, so I'm just going to figure out my, my best location to put those. Creating an intricate framework of pins along the shattered nine centimetre long femur is the only hope for the delicate bones to knit together, giving the young bird a chance of survival. Across Highland Wildlife Park and Edinburgh Zoo, in order to keep the animals in the best of health, keepers maintain an ongoing training programme, where they encourage the animals to do useful things in exchange for treats. At the giant panda enclosure, Alison has a training session planned with male panda, Yangguan. Hello, sausage. Right, what are we going to do? We're not training them to do tricks or anything like that. All the training that we do on section is for veterinary purposes. We'll have a chat with the vets and say, well, you know, what exactly is it that you would want to train this animal to do? And with the pandas, there there came quite a long list. Top of the list today is for Alison to work with Yangguan on training that will allow the vets to take blood tests and administer vaccines. We look at what's the easiest way for him to succeed at the training. When you watch the pandas, naturally, they'll naturally sit down. They'll quite often hold on to something. So then you think, OK, if we want to get a blood draw, what's the best way to do it? Well, the best way to do it is get him to hold on to something and, and put his arm out. And the vet needs to have his arm in a certain way so that he can get in between the bit of muscle and where the, the vein runs and, and get into it. And Yangguan knows exactly what Alison wants him to do. This is a blood sleeve. <laughs> and good boy. There we go. Right, right on. Good boy. Right. While he's on here and holding on, realistically, he can't pull his paw back. The pandas have formidable claws. And most animals that you can see that look slightly bow-legged when they're walking, bears, and they walk with the toes turned in, 
that allows them to, to fold their paws round and grip the trees. And Yangguan can pretty much run up a telegraph pole. And it is something that they'll use to swipe as well. Yeah, you, you know, you have to be extremely careful when you're working round about them. He's trained to hold on very tightly. And he's actually, he's, he's very good at this and very relaxed while we're doing it. But we will reinforce this training by holding and touching in here, because this is what the vet would do to find the vein. And he'd maybe poke in and hold on here and here and just touch and press. And all the time I'm doing this, I'm very aware of what this is doing on that hand. And he's, he, I can still feel him gripping very, very tightly. So I know at this point, I'm more than safe to do all this. I would love to think that Yangguan wouldn't deliberately hurt me, but he is an animal. And if he gets annoyed and decides to swipe, then he could hurt me. So I, I just never take that chance. Especially with bears, they don't have a huge amount of facial expressions as to whether they're getting annoyed or frustrated or anything like that. Good boy. What a star. Good boy. Right, finished. Back at the veterinary hospital and an hour into surgery, Adam, Steph and Hannah are still working on building a structure around the guinea fowl's thigh bone using one millimetre metal rods. So that, that lower pin has gone in fine and it's nice and stable in, in, so essentially it's gone through one side of the bone and then just outside the other side of the bone, so it's gripping both of them, which is what, what we want. The guinea fowl's femur, which runs from the hip to the knee, is only 5.7 millimetres thick. Adam's tiny drill bit is making holes half that size in order to secure fixing pins along its length. I think that is probably the best we can do with that. I'm fairly happy with how the pins have gone in, so we'll, we'll try that for now uh, and secure everything up. We might take another x-ray as well and just see where things are, but, but yeah, I'm pretty happy so far. It's been three hours, and Adam finally has all the pins in place. Done! Thank God! <laughs> right. We, we are almost there. Um, I just need to create a, an external fixator, which is essentially a bar that runs on the outside of the leg um, and ties together all of those pins that we've put in to hold everything rigid. So I'm just going to sort out the wound, which is a bit sore at the moment, and then um, and then we'll create that bar. But we're done done for everything surgical, really, which is which is good. Adam and Steph have found a clever solution for the awkward job of attaching the crossbar to the pins. So this is actually dental putty, which is very handy for lots of things. You can fix tortoise shell fractures with it, and we've done beak deformities we fix with it as well. So we use it for all kinds of things. But it's, um, it's essentially a powder and, and liquid that mix together and then it's set. Adam and Steph need to work really quickly. We want to be able to get it so it's a, a mouldable ball. As the putty goes from feeling like chewing gum to setting rock hard in a matter of minutes. This feels like it's still slightly sticky, isn't it? OK. Quick. <laughs> What's that feeling? It's okay. It's okay, isn't it? It's really okay. We've done the best fixation we can on that leg. With the technically tricky work complete, now for the final hurdle. We're almost at a point of, of recovering here now, so that's that's always the a, a bit of a worrying time with any anaesthetic, particularly with birds. Recovery is always a bit. Mm, okay. Yeah, so recovery is always a bit of a, a time we have to monitor them really closely and they can have, have a problem, but, um, but I think so far so good. The behaviour of the, the patient is really important for us. With, with, a, with a human, for example, if you, if you break a bone, then the doctor will tell you to rest up and take it easy and not put weight on the leg. Um, we don't have that luxury with animals. Can you fowl particularly have a, a, a massive panic response? So we really, yeah, thank you. So we really just want her to have a nice, calm recovery. 
the healing part of the uh, process is is absolutely as critical as as the surgery itself, and so there's quite a prolonged period of hoping that she will continue to behave well. It's okay. Yeah, just gathering everything up when she explodes. <laughs> To ensure that the guinea fowl doesn't undo all Adam's handiwork, she'll be on what's referred to as box rest, where she'll be kept warm, dry and well fed. At Highland Wildlife Park, building work for the Saving Wildcats project is progressing at pace. Foundations are being laid for new offices and vet surgeries and work continues on the breeding centre. We're just finishing off uh, branching and putting cover and furniture in for these enclosures. So it starts with um, putting logs up. We can then add browse, which is all the stuff you can see here. So some of it's natural and native. So we've got pine and spruce. And then we've also got the land dye, which is not natural or native, but it's really good for cover and it keeps its colour for a lot longer. Keepers Rachel and Sandra are making sure the cats and their future kittens have a comfortable new home. It's really important that we get these enclosures right because this is where these cats are going to be placed to breed. Number one is they need to feel comfortable. So they need to have places they can hide, lots of high to get places where they feel out of reach, but also they, they don't feel too exposed. So we want it to be natural as much as possible. We've still got a few more things to add in here, but particularly things like shelves, and we're about to bring in nest boxes this afternoon um, so that they've got places to hide. Giving the nest boxes a lick of paint is keeper Estelle, who recently moved here from Cotswold Wildlife Park. She's developed a healthy respect for the wildcats. They're so hardy um, and they're so fierce um, and strong and I think that says, says a lot actually, you know, they're just, they're not to be messed with. I remember my first day down looking after some, I was like, are they always this mean? Are they, you know, it's like going in with a tiger or a lion or something. You know, they've just got these huge personalities. They're just so feisty and they're not, they're not scared to tell you. Achieving the best results in breeding these strong-willed animals also requires careful planning in the matchmaking department. When we're breeding cats for release, there's a long process into pairing individuals. Those individuals will mate, hopefully, and produce kittens. And we will monitor them much more remotely with CCTV. It looks a bit more like a forest than it does an enclosure, and that's really what we're aiming for. The wildcat kitty has even provided the keepers with some much-needed new kit. Well, these are nice shiny new ones. I know, they're good, aren't they? They're not going to last that long, though, are they? <laughs> Great. New shovels, new tools. <laughs> Certainly we've gained a few muscles in the last couple of days, I'm sure. Bark's a really good substrate because it's natural and they obviously they like to bury their feces like all cats do. So we do need to add something like that. The Saving Wildcats project is a once-in-a-career opportunity for keepers like Rachel, who previously worked in the carnivore section. The fact that there was a chance to work solely with them and it being such an important conservation project. It was really, it's really the dream job that I wanted. This will be the first licensed release of wildcats into the Scottish Highlands. We need to make sure that they're healthy, but we also need to make sure they can hunt and survive in the wild once we've reintroduced them. So yeah, it's exciting, but we need to make sure we get everything right. No pressure. <laughs> Among the 30-plus bird species here at the zoo is a flock of seven eastern white pelicans. With fossil records going back 30 million years, these ancient birds are commonly found in freshwater lakes and deltas across parts of Europe and Africa. The first pelican enclosure here in Edinburgh was built around 100 years ago, but has recently been updated with the installation of glass panels. While the public gets a better view, it means more work for keepers Nick and Barry. First job you ever learn when you're a zookeeper, everybody thinks it's all glamorous. The first thing you do is learn how to do windows. It's probably like 120 windows, got to clean on both sides, so 
It's a big job. And while Nick was new to the zoo last year, Barry's been here for decades. I started uh, 22 years ago. Uh, primarily my job is to be out in the park doing talks and uh, tours, all that kind of stuff. But before life at the zoo, Barry had many jobs. Used to do a wee bit of, sort of gig stuff, did a wee bit of bodyguard. So, and ironically, I was a window cleaner as well. Not that that's showing right now, but, you know. <laughs> Despite Barry's background, there's one thing even he can't protect Nick from. There's a certain smell. There's definitely a certain smell. But it's not bad. There are worse jobs in the zoo. It's more the fact it's just never-ending. The never-ending story of cleaning at the zoo is essential in ensuring the highest levels of animal welfare and avoiding deadly viruses. Our pelicans moved down into the next enclosure about four months ago and moving back because the rules about avian flu of influenza have changed. And that would be great because it's some kind of des enclosures designed for them, whereas the enclosure down there isn't really. So it's a much bigger space for them. It would be good to get them back. But the pelican's return may have to be postponed, as Barry has found some new residents in the pond. We've discovered quite a lot of frog spawn around the edges, and because we want to protect, especially a native species, uh, we don't want to affect the, the frog spawn in any way. And because a number of years ago, uh, a fungal disease, which was um, Kitteridiomycosis, or Kitterid for short, and there was this massive risk of losing like 80% of the world's population of amphibians. And uh, so the minute there's any threat to amphibian life or anything that we see, we're like, right, OK, we'll just, we just want to give them a chance. So uh, we're just going to leave that area looking slightly messy at the moment, but it's for a good cause. What isn't endangered nowadays, to be honest? Another animal in danger is the guinea fowl, who broke her femur. It's now been 24 hours since Adam and the team worked on pinning her broken leg. The keepers have checked her this morning and she's eaten well overnight, so that's good. Yeah. But yeah, we just need to make sure all the, the metal work that we put in yesterday is still in place. Yeah. <laughs> no, it looks, it looks good. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, if I can just have, uh, yeah, I'll just um, give them a little bit of a clean at the pin sites. Flushing the wound with sterile saline solution reduces the risk of infection. Sorry, cat, you might get wet. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's, okay. it's cold. <laughs> Apologising to her or me. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, great. Oh. The first 24 hours after a, a major accident and a major surgery like that, there's ju just the fact that she's, she's made it through the night and she's, she's stable is a really good sign on its own. Um, she's also standing on the leg, which is good. She's putting it to the ground and putting a good amount of weight on it, which is a, a really good sign. And I think probably the, the biggest concern we had that was that she wasn't going to be calm um, and she might re-break the wound and re-break our, our fixation. Um, but actually, she's really calm. But this young guinea fowl isn't out of the woods yet. It's still a, a big break that needs to heal and we're very, very early days and there's plenty of things that could still go wrong. But I think everything is, is doing as it should at the moment and the fact that she's eating and calm is a really good sign for so soon after the surgery. Since early 2020, Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park have had to embrace the power of the internet to bring the hundreds of animals in their care into people's homes. Hi guys, welcome to Facebook Live. Uh, my name's Jasper, I'm the Education Officer at the Highland Wildlife Park. Up in the Highlands, Jasper is holding his first Facebook Live broadcast for the park's 100,000 plus followers. You can see what Debbie's doing. She's just clipping off some of the old hoof. Laura and Jasmine from the communications team are on hand for support. Thank you very much for allowing me to film you and talk to you. This has been absolutely fascinating. And crucially, to feedback to first time live streamer Jasper about how he did. You're happy with that? Mm -hmm. So, so far we've had 1.1 thousand people watching oh. and that has been in 30 minutes so we've posted the video to the Facebook page so people can go in and watch it 
um, maybe later on when they finish, so that'll stay on the page now. So that went amazing. Hey, this is all new learning tech for me, this know, is. <laughs> but it's, it's done really well, a first Facebook Live part. Live virtual learning sessions are being rolled out across both sites and in Edinburgh, one horned rhinos Sanjay and Khabib have become internet sensations, proudly shown off by senior keeper Erica and education officer Blair. Hi! This is amazing, isn't it? Um, and if I hold this up here, look at that, let go. Oh, yum, yum. And there's a huge amount, <laughs> a huge amount of slobber involved in feeding rhinos too, lovely. Launched a year and a half ago, these live sessions from the zoo and the park have brought their conservation message to over 20,000 people. Do you have any questions that you want to send myself and Erica here? Mm. Do just let us know. Back in the Highlands, Jasper is keen to build on the growing online interest in the park's fascinating residents. Looking for some food for a scatter feed. He's preparing to go live to some primary one children with one of the site's hugest and hungriest. A bit of apples, tomatoes and carrots and a very big fish. Walker the polar bear. Walker's keen sense of smell has brought him right to where Jasper needs him. But polar bears aren't known for their patience. Well, I've asked to join the meeting so they can let me in. Just as the bear walks away. Don't go. <laughs> it's a bit difficult when your star decides to leave. But he's all the way over there. Walk up! Come on! But the show must go on. Welcome to the Highland Wildlife Park. My name's Jasper. How are you doing? You want to learn about polar bears? Jasper does the only thing he can that'll bring Walker back. Oh, he's coming over now. When he stands up on his back legs and he stretches up high, he is twice my height. They are enormous. As long as Walker's being fed, Jasper can hit the kids with a hair-raising fact jamboree about polar bears. Now, how old are you guys? Five? Now, to give you an idea on how much meat a polar bear would eat in a day, they eat approximately 20 to 40 kilos of meat per day per bear. Now, you're probably thinking, well, how big's 20 to 40 kilos? It's about the average size of a five-year-old. What colour fur does a polar bear have? Not white, their fur is not white. It is actually clear like glass. If we look at him when he opens his mouth, you'll notice he's got a tooth missing. That's because I've got it. He had a sore tooth, so we had to take his tooth out so that he would feel better. What colour is their skin? Well done, it is black. I'm gonna say goodbye guys. See you later guys, bye bye. With Jasper finding his groove juggling tech, a hungry polar bear and a class full of inquisitive kids, he's proved that working with animals and children isn't that hard after all. <laughs> so I must admit, I was a little bit concerned at one point. He was just going, no, don't want to play. I'm staying where I am. in Edinburgh at the giant panda enclosure, Alison is someone else who knows how to get the best out of the animals. Right, I think that should just about be enough. Yo. As she continues training with Yangguan. What a good boy. Hey, you're going to come in here and we'll see how this works. Whenever the pandas need to be moved, keepers use a specially built crate, which also doubles up for health checks. This one's just been to the zoo's blacksmith for some alterations. We always had these plates here, and the idea was that um, we could get them to stick their legs out and if we needed to do an X-ray of the foot uh, or something. But we modified the crate a little bit because he's got a little claw that overgrows and the vet keeps needing to trim it. So the idea is we maybe train him to let his feet come out. Right, shall we try this? Let's get you in. Good boy. What a clever man. Hmm. 
But there's a problem. Yang Guan's foot still isn't quite lining up with the hole that the blacksmiths made. That's the claw there that curls. Um, OK. So ideally, this is his wee, this is the claw here. That is the problem, this one. Push that foot around a bit. You just need to put your foot through the hole. That's all you need to do. So if we go back to our amazing blacksmith and say to him that we possibly need a slightly, slightly more, ooh, look, he's almost there, more of a modification to just take this bar here out and run across here and make a slightly bigger door. That foot's through. As you can see, that is perfect. And now it's not. Is it a wee bit strange? Good boy. Good boy. I just don't need that foot. I need that one. But no opportunity is wasted. And whilst it might be the wrong foot, it's all positive reinforcement. I just want to touch the foot. Oh, let me touch that foot. What a good boy. Hey, what a good boy. But as with all training at the zoo, it takes place on the animals' terms. And when Yang Guan's had enough, it's time to stop for the day. <laughs> Just over 100 miles north, keepers Alex, Judith and Sophia are preparing to catch the onshore wildcats for their essential annual health check. Yeah, so Ranoch has been twice our successful breeding male before with our female Catherine. Some of these cats are earmarked to move to the new breeding centre and become part of the Saving Wildcats project. So it's important to ensure that they are healthy and free of disease. If you stand in the keeper porch, yes. It turns out herding cats is as difficult as it sounds. Twist it, twist it. Well done, very good. You grab him when you're secure. You let me know, okay? Yeah, scruff him, scruff him, scruff him, scruff him. If you're secure, you say when, okay, Sophia? Okay, yeah, let's the next. Okay? And with these cats, it's wild by name, wild by nature. Best thing, Sophia, to push him down. Yeah. So once he's on his, on his front, push him down. Do you feel like, like the gloves are not? Can you manage to scruff him from there? Like, I've caught him, but it's like the lightest bit of skin. <laughs> the wild cat doesn't understand why you're trying to catch them. Like with any animal, you know, their animals are always going to get scared if you can't explain to them that I'm catching you for your health. Go, 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 go. Perfect. Hey, cool. Well done, Sophia. Well done. And yeah, not the kittens we usually catch. Yeah. <laughs> You do wish sometimes, that's probably the dream thing you have as a keeper is if you could actually speak to animals because a lot of these situations would become a lot less stressful if they just sat there, let you give them a vaccination or something and it's done. We often get visitors who say I've got a feisty cat at home, but I don't think they do. <laughs> Edinburgh Zoo, another set of feisty characters are the seven eastern white pelicans, who have been rounded up to receive an important vaccine ahead of moving back into their refurbished enclosure. With beaks almost half a metre in length, Sean knows they can be a bit of a handful, and he's called for backup. We've got the, the whole team today because uh, it can sometimes be a bit tricky to catch them, herd them in. It's enough of us down here to do a a quick, uh, quick catch there and, and <laughs> hopefully it all gets done quickly and smoothly. What we'll do is we'll catch them, bring them out and do it out there. And you can see they, they know what's going on. There's one in particular that uh, we all fight over who's not catching her up and that's the yellow banded one. She tends to go for your face when you're anywhere near her. So, um, so that, that's, going to be the, that's going to be the trickiest one to catch. So we'll try and avoid her. <laughs> Pelicans, though large, are lightweight, but pose a particular problem. They do, they ha I have, in times, uh, had their beaks around my head. They have got a fair sized beak, but there's not a lot of power generated in them. But they do have little ridges inside, uh, which, is, which can be quite sharp. Um, uh, so they, it's, it's almost like getting lots and lots of paper cuts at once. But they, so they can be quite sharp um, and leave, leave scratches and things on your face. So you've got to be really careful. You're good to go. Perfect. With everyone briefed on Pelican procedure, 
Sean needs his first willing accomplice. Who wants to come in and do some pelican catching? <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> but before Keeper Georgina can even get hands on... Do you guys want two birds just now, actually? They have an escapee. They are going to have to deal with the worst one first. So this was the yellow-banded one we've all tried to avoid getting. <laughs> Vet Adam and a team of vet students are primed for the first pelican. Hello. Okay. <laughs> We've got the aggressive one first. Oh dear. Got some yeah. Bashes on the face. Okay. A common ailment in pelicans relates to their feet. So there's a, a, a bit of overgrowth of the, the keratin there. There's a little bit of early bumble foot. But actually, we monitor these every year and they haven't changed. The main, uh, I guess, problem that we monitor in our pelicans is that some of them have some changes on their feet uh, called pododermatitis. The good thing is that we tend to see very little change year on year, so we're, we're happy with that. With, I guess, anything that goes wrong in an animal, we always want to record it, and we'll describe it in our clinical notes, but the best way to make a record is with a photo, so we tend to have lots of photos on our phones of different strange bits of animal. With photos of feet filed for future reference, the birds can be vaccinated and released, which can't come too soon for the most difficult of the bunch. Yeah, that's, uh, that went quite nicely. Um, and uh, we've got the aggressive one first, so the rest should be easy now. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, we just want to try and really get the... Uh, Keep the wings nice and tight into the body. And keep the, if we can control the feet as well, and just give them less way to to wriggle. <laughs> With even the most problematic pelicans processed, it's business as usual, and Sean can breathe a sigh of relief. Well, yeah, I, um, it went quite well actually. There was no major issue with the birds and uh, nothing got any worse body scoring was fine the bird got the vaccination quite quite nicely so it was yeah, fairly quick and smooth so birds are nice uh, out in their main exhibit now uh, which is just ready to reopen for the um, public it's like we've never been away Inside the giant panda enclosure at Edinburgh Zoo, a heavy-duty forklift, also known as a telehandler, has arrived to take the 200-kilogram panda crate to the zoo's blacksmith for some modifications. Master of the blowtorch is Rab, responsible for building and maintaining much of the metalwork, both practical and decorative, in the zoo. So it's good work in the keepers. Obviously, they've got the the best interest in animals, that's, that's the priority. And a lot of times you come to loggerheads because I'm just wanting to get the job done, and they're saying no for the animal. So you've got to learn to deal with that side of things, which is the right, because animals are more important. When we first built that, now it's had scales added to it, then they've got the perspex added, it, added to it, so there's always stuff. Obviously Alison keeps me very much what she's, what she's wanting. I need, I need, I need a favour, right? <laughs> I don't work for Brazil, I work for Alison. <laughs> <laughs> Today's task for Rab is widening the left foothole for Yangguan. I'll show you now. Right. Fab. Right. Thank you very much. No problem. Rab's worked at the zoo for a few years now, but wasn't sure initially if it was the right place for him. And I was reading the local paper and the advertisement for the Edinburgh Zoo. I applied, came for the interview. Got the job, so I phoned my wife up and said, look, I've got the job, but I was, I was panicking, you know, and she goes, well, when, when you get a chance to work at a zoo again? She goes, you know, always work in a workshop. Why not get a try? And 16 years later, I'm still here, so I must like it. Job done. An easy one, eh? If you do it right. <laughs> At the veterinary hospital, Adam and the team are preparing for the next stage of recovery for the guinea fowl with the broken femur. So what I'm doing today is just starting the process of removing all this metalwork. So we're going to cut the connection between the pin which goes in the middle of the bone 
and the bar which is on the outside of the leg. Um, and it's, it's a process that we call dynamic destabilization. So we're slowly taking the metalwork off to allow the bone to uh, have a little bit more forces applied to it, which will, will actually encourage it to heal and build some of the struts back in internally, uh, which give the bone its support. If we, if we just took everything off in one go, there's a risk that it could just re-break because at the moment it's in a fragile state. So this method hopefully will prevent that from happening. A series of x-rays are required to reassure the team that the bone is healing as it should. Okay, right. Yeah, okay, so that's fine. This is our IM pin, so you can see it coming down here and seated in the bottom of the femur here. It looks nice, that's fine. But yeah, I think that looks okay. It looks okay. It is difficult to see healing when you've got all that metal work in the way, but I can see some signs of some uh, callus forming, which is that kind of fluffy repairing bone, uh, which looks good. And there's also no signs of the, the bone uh, fading away around the pins, which would be an indicator of infection. So I'm happy with what we can see there. We're going we're gonna to cut that connection. Oh, hang on. It's all right. It's the swab. <laughs> That's why we have a swab there. Thankfully, the swab snagging on the high-speed cutting tool hasn't caused the patient any harm. Fine. OK. I'll just give them a wipe, maybe, and then we'll flush them. That connection between the, the X-Rex and the, the pins in the bone is now uh, uh, out the way, which is what we wanted, so that's fine. Good, I'm happy, yep. Yeah. Happy. This first part of the dynamic destabilization has gone well, but bringing the guinea fowl round requires constant observation. Just check the bin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Mrs. Calm yourself. While all the signs of the guinea fowl making a full recovery are good, she still has a long way to go. She still needs to have two more anaesthetic procedures and x-rays to take everything off. So it, it's always kind of a, a little bit concerning when we have to anaesthetise a bird for any reason. But I think what we're seeing so far is, is, is good signs. It's all going in the right direction at the moment. Highlands, the wildcats are having a full health check under sedation. First up is Ranach, the oldest male. So Ranach is a beautiful big boy. He's already contributing to the Scottish wildcat um, breeding programme. He's sired some litters of kittens. One of the reasons we're anaesthetising him is to do the regular disease checks, to make sure that he's free from any feline infectious diseases that might be a problem in the future. For vets Ellie and Alice, this is routine but important work. We'll swab his eyes and his throat and then we'll send that to the lab and make sure he doesn't have any infectious diseases before he moves to the breeding centre. His temperature looks normal. So his oral exam's good, his teeth all look fine, there's no fractures, there's no sign of infection. He hasn't got any injuries around his mouth or his face. So the things that we look for when we're doing a wildcat health check is really a full nose to tail MOT. So not just the clinical, looking at the teeth, listening to the heart, palpating the abdomen, making sure that the reproductive organs are all present and functional. Um, we also do blood tests and other tests yeah. to make sure that the animals aren't carrying diseases that the animals are fully vaccinated, that they're microchipped. So we're trying to do everything we possibly can to um, make sure that these animals are as healthy as possible. And healthy animals will have a better quality of life. So we're just collecting a urine sample now. So Alice is just gently expressing his bladder. Um, urine is a really valuable sample for cats because um, it tells us how well the kidneys are working if he's concentrating his urine well. 33 and 15. Okay, so his respiratory rate and heart rate are nice and stable. Alice is just collecting a blood sample from his jugular vein. So we can see from the colour of the blood that he's actually really well oxygenated, which is great. So we'll send that to the lab and they can tell us all sorts of information about him that we can't necessarily get from just looking at him. Rannock's examination is top to toe and everywhere in between. 
<laughs> so because he's a breeding male, his, um, his genitals are quite important for us to check that they're healthy and look fine. So he's got little spines on his penis that are fairly well developed. Um, cats are induced ovulators, so that means that when Rannoch mates a female, he's got to be um, vigorous enough that he stimulates her to ovulate. These guys deserve the very best um, and we're relying on cats like Rannoch to be the, the founders of what will hopefully be Scotland's wild living wildcat population. So these cats are incredibly valuable genetically and as individuals. We've finished. For a breeding male, he's just absolutely perfect. Examination over and with a clean bill of health, Rannoch is released back into his enclosure. But this is only the start for the keepers and vets. Over the next two days, all the cats at the park will be caught and checked. In Edinburgh, the seven eastern white pelicans have been safely resettled in their purpose-built enclosure. Though their disapproval of the vaccination process has left Nick and Barry relying on another of their skills. I'm gonna go for it. So we're just feeding the pelicans, so they get, well, as many feeds as they kind of need throughout the day, but roughly around, they're offered around roughly around eight kilograms of fish, seven kilograms of fish. I'm hoping by throwing it into the water they would come into the water, but they, the thing is, they're not, they're not too confident. So you're just trying to throw the fish to wherever they are. If that's land, if that's water, however you can get it into their mouths, that's, that's fine, really. He's not giving me a shot yet. <laughs> On, he's, he's hogging all the fish. <laughs> this is where mine goes over the fence yeah. and hits a visitor. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Ideally, You're just assaulting them with fish. <laughs> <laughs> Normally where we feed them, they're close enough you can just chuck it in their mouths, basically. But where we're feeding them at the moment, it's a bit more tested, you see? It becomes slightly more problematic in the mornings because they each have to have a vitamin. So you're specifically having to target certain pelicans, and one of them has meds as well. So them, <laughs> them being quite a distance from you does make it slightly more difficult. But... Thankfully, there are only seven pelicans, and Barry has great aim. Right in the mouth. They'll be happier in this enclosure, and, and the public will be able to see them. And they're amazing animals, so it makes more sense for them to be in a walk for enclosure like this. It's a big day at the panda enclosure, with vet Simon and Steph arriving to give Yang Guan his health check and vaccination. It's an opportunity to put his new training to the test. Yeah, we, we may have to use something more of a reward than carrot, but I'll try and see how he, how he behaves. You won't find panda vaccines in stock at the local pet shop. This one's been flown in from a lab in North America. The pressure is on to get it right. What a good boy. So I've got him in the back, so I'll just get him on the blood sleeve. Is that the easiest bit to do? OK. Come on, then. What a good boy. I know, I know, you're all right. Right on. Right on, please. Good boy. Good boy, good boy. Hold. 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 Good boy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hold. Good boy. Good boy. And hold. Lad. Yeah. Come on then. You can come off the sleeve just now. Good boy. Now for the health check. I know, I know. Good lad. Show Simon your teeth. Good boy. Good boy. Come up. Yeah, he's going to sit down. I'll get him to scooch in. Yeah, scooch. 
Good boy. Yang Wan has known Alison and Simon for over 10 years. They even spent time with him in China before he made the trip to Edinburgh. I've got to know him really, really well. Uh, and I think he and I certainly seem to have a good working relationship. He's always been extremely uh, positive and we can sort of have a conversation, as it were, and he'll, he'll respond in a positive fashion. What a good boy you were. It's you ready, ready to do all that. It's about uh, 1,200 pound a panda. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> that was fabulous. He, he behaved extremely well, so he was very good, considering we're putting a needle in him for a few buttons of carrot, then, you know, I think the trade-off's pretty good. At Highland Wildlife Park, work is almost complete at the wildcat enclosures. Final preparations are underway to ensure this corner of the park remains as secluded and protected as possible. This is our changing area, but it's also our biosecurity fire break. It means that everything that stays in the centre, stays in the centre, and everything that stays outside, stays outside. Biosecurity means everything must be disinfected to prevent any diseases spreading to the cats and their kittens. For keepers like Rachel, Estelle and Sandra, it means a lot of cleaning and clothing changes. Yes, even though we're, um, we're obviously cleaning our boots before we go in, it just, it just makes it even better that we're being extra safe. Um, but these boots will never go into the breeding centre, so we can't contaminate these cats with anything else. Oh, this hole goes straight into our underpant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you got underpants on? <laughs> I mean our <laughs> under, I under mean. trouser. Yeah. Oh, that's handy. Someone's got my wellies on. <laughs> Mine feel big, so maybe me. Yeah, does it say six on the side? I don't know. And it's not just people that need to be biosecure. Are you bringing the vehicle in? You'll have to get sprayed. So we've got a disinfectant spray for any vehicles that are coming in, um, just to make sure that they're not going to carry anything from elsewhere in the park into the green centre. Because um, there's no point in us doing all this and trying to be completely biosecure and then bring in a digger that could have been anywhere. That's, that's what does it, that's what brings something in that shouldn't be here. So. As well as being biosecure, the cats need to feel secure. So the team are making sure they have plenty of freshly painted dens. You know, when the cats are in them, you know, they're really lovely and snug. Um, when we're putting them in, we're just putting them into nice cozy corners. So when the cats do retreat into them, they feel nice and secure and safe. Really? Unlike my dad, I'll be in the background going, she's got that at the wrong angle. <laughs> got a couple of little bits left to do once we've done all the inside we need to put a bit of cover around the outside because this is quite exposed and then that's it we just want cats now <laughs> we need cats after almost two months of essential box rest the guinea fowl who had the shattered femur is ready to take the giant leap into an outside enclosure and for senior keeper Sean Meekin, it's a huge relief. So she just had her pins removed three, four days ago now, and uh, she's putting weight on. She's you know moving around the box just fine. So yeah, she's done. She's done great um, in terms of that, that recovery aspect of it. Um, we did. We did. We did say that she's probably the best bird to have had this happen to because she's so relaxed, so calm. So that's actually helped her overall. Uh, her recovery. If it had been one of the birds that would have um, a bit more, uh, a bit more jumpy or aggressive, it would have been much more difficult to keep them, to keep them calm, to keep that that bone setting and stuff. It is a very nervous process because months of recovery can be undone in a split second. So it's something that yeah we're always very worried about. She's going up to one of our offshore enclosures. It's a small smaller holding area um, and it's it's allowing us the opportunity to introduce the two females together assess how she she does in a slightly larger space um, as part of her recovery and um, it's also a quieter spot so that there might be less things to to give her a fright which could then obviously 
any reaction to, to some stimulus like that could cause her to further injure herself. So it's a, it's a nice halfway house before she gets introduced to a larger aviary. Hello. Hello. That's good. Got a nice thick layer of the substrate as well, so. She's moving quite nice. Yeah, she's moving quite nicely actually. Slightly stiff, but that's, I think that I think that's expected, yeah. Great. I'll go, and, I'll go and grab the other one. It's important at this stage to re-socialise her, especially given that she's been isolated for so long. And who better to keep her company than her sister? However, her sibling doesn't possess the same calm demeanour. So far that's gone, it's gone pretty well actually. The, the female that has the, the broken legs casually, calmly walked out with no crashing around so how she hasn't <laughs> immediately re-damaged her, her injury. Um, but yeah, you can instantly see the other bird there. She just came flying out, crashing out. So it was a, the difference in behavior between them is, uh, <clears throat> is quite, quite evident. There's not, no aggression. There's no sort of winding the other up to, to say, increase any likelihood of, of damage. So I think it's going quite nicely so far. Yeah, I think this is definitely a, a successful outcome and really everything we could <laughs> hope to, to have been. Um, I think really the hope now is that she can she can live her life here. I think we're hoping in the future that we will get a, an, another male uh, and pair her up as well. And there's no reason why she couldn't go on to be a breeding animal in the flock now as well. And it's good news from Highland Wildlife Park. The keepers have moved two of their wildcats into the new enclosures and a step closer to releasing them into the wild. We're really pleased with how the cats have settled in to the breeding centre so far. I think you always feel quite privileged to work with any animal. I mean, all zookeepers will say that, but to be able to work with a species that has primarily gone extinct and that we're essentially going to reintroduce is not many people can say that in this country in particular. So it's, yeah, it's, it feels very special to be a part of and um, I feel very privileged to be able to be part of that. In terms of career highlights, yeah, this is, this is definitely at the top of the list. There's not really much more exciting projects. For me personally, it's, it's a huge achievement that we're here and hopefully we can give Wildcats the best chance ever.